you so much. All right. Uh, my name is Kritika. I'm a PhD student at Boston University. And the title of my talk today is Long Non-Coding RNA Link RNA, PCG Regulatory Networks are Responsive to Diverse Xenobiotics in Rat Liver. Uh, rat has been a very model, a well-known model organism for xenobiotic-based studies, and that is why we are using rat here. And liver is what our group focuses on, uh, depending on liver-based diseases and hepatic cancer. So our special interest is in liver. So as we know that liver is a central organ for metabolism. It's involved in maintaining blood glucose level, xenobiotic metabolism, and biosynthesis. And it, there is an interesting phenomena that you see in liver where you see the gene expression profile in the same cell type across different zones of the liver is different. And that phenomena is known as metabolic zonation, which is quite interesting about liver. So xenobiotics in this case are, for us, our list of foreign ch chemicals, which can be drugs, hormones, or enzymes. And here in this list, we have 115 rat liver data sets uh, taken from National Toxicology Program, treated with 27 different xenobiotics that have seven different modes of action. Now, the modes of action, uh, one classical example is that of a car receptor, where you would see that a nuclear receptor interacts with the xenobiotic and then has a downstream gene expression uh, difference. So now, another possibility here is that your xenobiotic can have an, another mechanism where it induces DNA damage and cytotoxicity uh, without interacting with the nuclear receptor. In any case, we have different seven uh, categories of modes of action which are involved in this data set. Now here we bring in an interesting hypothesis that what if there is a missing piece of information that's missing out here in the downstream gene transcription effect, which can be link RNAs or say long non-coding RNAs. Uh, having said that, we know there is a big history of long non-coding RNAs being uh, standard for chromatin mod modification. They are involved in X inactivation, and they have been widely involved in having some regulatory relationships. So we try to explore that possibility and develop a hypothesis that says that xenolinks or link RNAs that are responding to these xenobiotics can then have a regulatory relationship in modulating the, the gene expression downstream and be involved in liver toxicity or cytotoxicity. Um, just a brief introduction about what link RNAs are. So link RNAs are a subclass of non-protein coding RNAs of the larger uh, category in the mammalian transcriptome. They are typically 200 long base pairs long, and uh, they are known to form secondary and tertiary structures. And they are highly tissue and cell type specific in terms of their expression. So now the first thing that we have to do in this case is to first uh, discover link RNAs, which is what we did. So we used two different protocols, one developed in the lab, which is purely based on what is known about link RNAs in terms of their features, in terms of their length and expression. And the other one was a tool taken by uh, the Broad Institute called Slinky, which basically uses a little different approach of syntonic identification, which we found was pretty interesting and useful. So we used the best of both worlds, combined the methods, and came up with uh, 5,798 link, rat liver link RNAs, out of which we found 1,447 that were responding uh, to one or more xenobiotics over here with their mode of actions represented in the colors. However, we found 352 that were regulated by at least 10 or more chemicals, which was interesting because even though you have these chemicals with different modes of action, their regulation at the transcription, at the transcription level is not specific, but they crosstalk, which is what we found as an interesting piece of evidence. So we moved on to the next thing where we need to annotate the function of the link RNA, and we used a typical co-expression analysis using WGCNA to come up with seven different protein coding gene modules, uh, which were then enriched uh, for their functional enrichment. And we found these three uh, of the modules which were very relevant to what we were trying to study in terms of liver. So lipid metabolism, cholesterol, which is, again, a, an important function of liver. We had an immune-based uh, module and then a PPR signaling and fatty acid metabolism-based uh, module that was interesting here. However, if you have done your statistics right, you would know that correlation does not infer causality. So we need to do some causal inference, which is what is the next piece of evidence. So now we are trying to see which of the link RNAs and protein coding genes in each of the modules have some causal relationships by doing a, a DAG chart enrichment analysis. So the idea here is to use a parallel IDA method, which means an inference of directed acyclic graph. So you try to infer the directionality of inference using some conditional independence test between 
two nodes and see which of them have dependence or independence and then remove the edges if they do not have any causal effect on each other. And then you develop this uh, DAC chart which compares with the original DAC chart which is what is hidden uh, in our case. So we use the expression data to run those tests and then apply a do calculus which is a linear uh, model of trying to evaluate the value of y, uh, the beta coefficient for y um, function as a function of x. So now here we have a heat map of the causal scores for module red, which is one of the modules for protein coding genes. And this particular link RNA, even though all of them are highly correlated with this, all these set of protein coding genes, showed a very strong causal effect uh, on these set of protein coding genes, which was really interesting and proved the fact and importance of why causal inference is important along with correlation. So using that information, uh, we came up with our link RNA, mRNA regulatory causal correlation network, where here we are uh, filtering the edges based on an absolute correlation value of greater than 0.8. And we are showing the effect of causality in terms of the edge width. So wherever you're seeing these dark green edges, so there are a lot of edges over there, but the ones that are highlighted are the ones that have a strong causal effect. Now, the last piece of inference over here in, in order to establish regulation would be to find hubs and bottlenecks in a network, because in a biological network, those pieces are important for regulation. So we found a couple of list and, uh, a list of link RNAs in each of the modules that were top hubs in terms of their ranking in top 25 over the entire list, and also the bottlenecks. And then we saw that some of them were hubs, and some of them were bottlenecks, and some of them were both, which was quite interesting. And we found that uh, most of those terms had the enrichment terms that we, we got from the functional enrichment analysis. So this was our putative list, which can actually be called as putative regulatory link RNAs and can be taken into the experimental setup to test. However, um, there's a little more future work that needs to be done, which I'm going to talk about in terms of orthology, orthologue discovery. So we are going to discover some orthologues for these list of link RNAs in different species of uh, mice and ma in humans, because orthology confers functionality. Uh, in conclusion, we found uh, xenolinks, which respond to different xenobiotics, uh, in some cases to multiple xenobiotics. Uh, we have some putative link RNAs that can regulate the expression of protein coding genes either in cis or in trans, and co-expression analysis combined with causality would be a more powerful model in order to reduce the false positives and try to find a computationally a regulatory uh, element in a network. In acknowledgments, I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. David Baxman, uh, my lab, Baxman Lab um, members, uh, ISCB, which is my travel fellowship sponsor, and PU Bioinformatics program, and the admin staff, which made this happen for me. Thank you so much. Um, so, what proportion of the, those link RNAs do you think have orthologs? Uh, because a lot of them are recently evolved, no? Yes. Yeah, so, the idea of finding an ortholog in link RNAs or uh, non-coding RNAs per se is a little different from protein coding genes because they do not have a function. So, their conservation in terms of the sequence uh, specificity would reduce as you go by evolution. So what we do in this case is something called as a syntonic ortholog, where you try to see the protein coding neighborhood for a link RNA in a genomic region and try to match it up with related species. And if you find the same neighborhood or syntonic block uh, being conserved, that means they are uh, putative orthologs. And that is what is the right approach to, uh, to go forward with it. I have a question. Yes. Um, do you think it's possible that the, the link RNAs, which are responsive to many mm -hmm. chemicals, are somehow um, like top detox activation or something like that? So I, would, I, would, I would totally agree with that because uh, in any, any of the modes of action that we have, uh, signaling is involved and there are very, very commonly uh, used pathways that are involved no matter which mode of action you choose, right? So like forming a dimer or localization. So these are all the functions that are involved no matter which way you go. So if you're seeing those set of link RNAs that are responding to 10 or more, they might probably be having that kind of function where they're involved, they are required in each mode of the action, which says a lot about the fact that they are cross-talking with each other in terms of uh, their regulation downstream. And that has also been seen uh, for the cases of nuclear receptors where they always cross-talk and interact. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.